Okay. You can you can see the one that was in the You can see the one that was in the like where the color And then I said it was being in the plane. Well, you told me that was like Sam Rowe. I don't think that was being in the plane. Okay, and then I looked at it was being in the plane. Even just like two things. I'm not a robot. No, it was being in the plane. It was being in the plane. Okay. things about the eclipse because it was so cool. It wasn't that cool here. It was, I mean, it's, if it happened every day, you'd be pretty excited. But I wish it, you know, when it's once every 20 years or something, I wish it was just a little better here. But we had a lot of people in the department who got to see the full thing. And I'm really happy about that. And all manner of stories coming back uh, to, to tell us about it. So here's a really cool map that Tomer Bird put together. I think he's at somewhere in NSF. I forget now where he is. Uh, and so, you, first of all, there's some lines on here that tell you the fraction of totality. So the 90% band was just to our south of Chicago, and then it's another one to the east of Nashville. And um, then all these dots are 30-minute temperature changes as recorded by ASOS stations around the country. And so this is at 1 o'clock, just before totality hit anywhere in the continental U.S. And so almost every station, you look at, I mean, Nantucket, of course it's probably going to be cooler if the wind's off the ocean, which is almost any direction. Maybe in the last hour it got cooler. Same at Cleveland. Who knows what's going on at Cleveland? <laughs> Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is there. There may be some other accoutrement of that that has something to do with that temperature. Actually, these are automated observing stations. But that's it. I mean, mid-afternoon, everywhere has been warmer by 1 o'clock than it was at 12.30 or 1.30 than it was at 1. We're about to see what happens when the moon gets in front of the sun. Uh, and most of this was clear. I think this part here was presumably, I think was pretty darn clear. Everybody sorry. You guys were just north of Indianapolis? The west of your corner. Oh, or so east, sorry, sorry. Towards east. Ohio. So like yeah, West Lafayette yeah. area, something yeah. like that? Okay. And so that's pretty much right smack dab at 100%. And we were at about 89. So let's watch this go. It's only seven seconds, but we'll keep on playing it. It's just so awesome. Remember, these are these are half hour temperature changes. Whoa. Isn't that dramatic? <laughs> So, you know, we had, a, we had a call from when Steve and I were on the radio before this saying, how will the eclipse affect the weather? And I, I think people were looking for some grand change. But I have to admit, it never occurred to me that it'd be on the order of eight, six to 10 degree temperature change in a half an hour. And even here at 89%, it got cooler. And Brad was going on, <laughs> was running around upstairs, remember that, saying, oh, I feel chillier than I did an hour ago. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. But I felt that it got a little bit colder. But look at this. It's just exactly. Uh, in the five to 10 degree range, just so dramatic. And then it quickly recovers because it was sunny in most of these places and it came right back. Look at the response. Wow. Question, these are ASOS. Uh, yeah. Is there any comparison with the models? Just to see how oh. good or bad the models I are? don't know, I don't know. Um, I and know the HER had the eclipse. Exercise. The HER model had the eclipse in its radiation code. I don't know about any other. Does that uh, output every 15 or so minutes too? At it like, yeah. Does it? That would be great to see that. Because then there's probably a pressure wave, too, that should be detectable, I would think. But I don't know about that. But the recovery in the totality places was more dramatic than over here. I mean, we got a little bit cooler. You'll see it go blue. But nothing like the gradient of change over that period of time, except in the region where it was total. 
So you go down five degrees and you come back up, it's almost like an overcorrection. You know, by the time you're at, maybe peak heating of the day was 2.30 or so in that place probably, and that's just about when the sun came back out. So it's really awesome, isn't it? Just great, something weird going on. You could also identify some stations that are potentially problematic. That's too cold and then way too warm. So something's wrong with that station in southern New Hampshire. But, um, but overall, the picture is spectacular. Uh, just fantastic. So I'm glad this was done. And, and so I, I should get back to that comment. The, um, the eclipse does affect the weather, but I was telling, I told this person on the radio somewhat snarkily. I said, I think the weather is going to have more an effect on the eclipse and Pete's a veteran of that unfortunate experience where the clouds potted minutes after totality and where Pete was in the Dallas area. But you got a pretty good view of a couple of things, so I'm glad about that. Okay, uh, I guess that's all I wanted to say about this, but it's great that it's uh, so obvious. I showed it to class today too, I'm so glad that it was available. So here's our weekly satellite movie over the continental US and adjacent waters. So we're starting out early in the week. It's been a stormy week in the, in the North Atlantic off the coast. We'll see that's storm number one. We had severe weather across the southeast United States this week. Uh, and it took a while for the storm associated with that severe weather to really put itself together. But we had a pretty decent amount of rain from the first vestiges of that storm. And then most of it stayed away from us, a little drizzle uh, yesterday afternoon. Less than I anticipated, so I was glad about that. But um, it's been a fairly active subtropical uh, stream across Mexico. Mexico steals a lot of that water vapor, though. Boy, it's hard to squeeze it out unless you really organize it and have a stream coming from the Gulf of Mexico. But this time of year is a really exciting time of year, as probably anybody knows. You know, it's the beginning of the severe weather season in the Central Plains, and that's not coincidence. I mean, that's because in, in early and in mid-April, you're getting upper-level troughs making their way south of the Gadsden Purchase area there in Arizona and New Mexico. And so they tap that elevated mix layer over northern Mexico, send that out over the plains, and meanwhile, low-level moisture advection off the Gulf of Mexico kind of cooks up the boundary layer. So you're high theta E in the boundary layer, relatively low theta E, and well mixed through a deep column on top of that. And if you can make the air rise, and son of a gun, isn't the very upper trough that drags the elevated mix layer out over the plain a mechanism for lifting the air once it's been assembled in that column over Texas? And that's what happened this week. And it's the first example of what will probably be repeated a number of times at this time of year, because the ingredients are so splendid for that. No place else in the world is there uh, such proximity between the extremely high boundary layer theta E's in the western Gulf of Mexico and the bone dry mixed layer over the uh, Mexican plateau. Uh, the Atlas Mountains of Algeria and, um, and um, the southern Mediterranean is another place where it's pretty close but not quite the same. And consequently, southern Spain and, and um, parts of North Africa can get some really intense thunderstorms, but no place has it better than us. And uh, it's right to our south. So uh, you saw the flooding rains in Louisiana and New Orleans, especially uh, mid part of the week. That's all tied to that development. And so now that whole complex has turned itself into a really massive cyclone over the eastern part of North America. We'll see some of the ways in which that's reflected in the upper level charts here in a minute. Uh, but you can see twin cyclones, one over the plains, one over the Atlantic, and then the next, the big severe weather outbreak and the upper trough finally migrating across and turning this thing into a better organized system late in the week, starting to do so right now. And that's the feature that we have uh, to our east right now. Meanwhile, uh, a very impressive upper trough has kind of slid southward uh, out of the Gulf of Alaska and is now positioned off the coast of California. And uh, you can see the cloudiness in this oblique view here associated with it. Some of that's though from the pre-existing the pre ridge. The next thing that comes down in this flow, I think you'll see, is going to be trough-like, and it's at the edge of this image, unfortunately. But that's, there it is, starting to show up. Um, you'll see it kind of spinning off the northern California coast. I'm sorry, right there. That's the feature of interest at this late time. So let's take a look now at, um, at maybe just the, the most recent satellite movie. It's hard to keep up with the animation when you go for the whole week. So sometimes some of those points cannot be made as well as I think they might be at a shorter time frame. So here's the cyclone of interest over uh, the northeast United States and far southern Canada. And so we're just out of the slop, the low level stratus. Some of this is precipitating, but that might be orographic. We'll see when we look at the satellite. And then we can see a, a kind of a gentle northerly flow you know, dragging some cirrus off of uh, what, be, what might be some lake effect precipitation in the northern part of the state over us. Widespread clearing though in the central plains is a kind of a modest anticyclone that stretches all the way through the Dakotas and then down into Texas. 
uh, today, and that's reflected in, in these clear skies. Almost a shame that Monday didn't have this particular weather situation, although then Patrick and the rest of the group wouldn't have seen what they saw here. Yeah. So, and, you know, I suppose there's plenty to do in Dallas, but there's nothing to do in Indiana. So you better hit, you better hit Peter when you go to Indiana. So that's a, sorry, Indian, Indiana. Uh, but it is true. We all know. And then here's the, uh, the upper feature off the coast. And we'll get a little bit better view of that from a couple of different perspectives in a minute. Look at this stratus deck off the California coast going deep into the subtropics. Very, very interesting. I don't know anything about the climatology of this, uh, but there's people in the department who do. And I wonder if that's an unusually wide expanse of this stratocumulus at this time of year, or if it's kind of normal. I don't know. Uh, so, okay, let's start looking at some of our upper level charts then. Uh, first, the radar. I want to see what the radar looks like. And then we'll eventually go to the West Coast, but we'll go over the continental US uh, first. So here's the radar elements. I think for sure that this precipitation is more continuous off the uh, southern Atlantic coast, the, the Carolinas and so on. It's just too far out to see. We can't see it. And Hamilton's too far to the east, so I don't think it would help either. So that's probably a pretty decent precipitation band, at least down to the latitude of maybe the southern part of South Carolina. And then uh, some precipitation closer to the center of the storm here in central or eastern New York State. And then this is the backwash on the western side. And sure enough, some of this is precipitating in the lee of the lakes, and maybe high terrain there in northern Michigan has something to do with it. I'm not sure. There's um, unterrain related precipitation over northeastern Ohio, so there may also be some mechanism for lift. We'll investigate that as we go to the upper level charts. Here's really interesting. This is cool, actually. I didn't see this earlier in the day. Here comes this fairly continuously well organized region of precipitation coming across Indiana into Kentucky, and then pushing ahead of it air that's climbing the eastern side, the western side of the Appalachians here, like at Knoxville. It pops out into um, popcorn cumulus. That's really interesting. So it's like the whole layer is being lifted. It must not be wildly unstable, but unstable enough that little little spots that get an ascent column going have uh, corresponding descent and squash the weak ascent that would be going on in the not so poorly stratified surroundings. I wonder if that isn't part of what's going on there. That's really interesting, the geometry of what results upon going up the slope. Uh, I don't know. Very interesting. And then here's some of the um, precipitation off the California coast, uh, in some of it on uh, in the northern part of the valley. That's interesting, persistent and kind of banded looking. So that's really interesting. And that's it across the country. Uh, finally, the, the uh, middle Atlantic and the northeast will, by the end of the day, be out of the rain. But it's been a rainy week for them, especially the second half of the week. It's been really pretty bad. Brewers were rained out yesterday so in Baltimore, so they'll have to, probably now they'll see Corbin Burns during that series which it won't be nice for us, good for them. Um, okay, let's uh, go to the, uh, I think we should look at the West Coast satellite image first before I look at the upper level charts, because I don't want to have to not say something about a feature that I know is on those charts. So here's the, the West Coast image. Uh, the state of Hawaii is right here, so this is the boundary of the northern subtropics. And so there's a really decent cyclone out in the central part of the uh, Pacific Basin. Much of this precipitation cloudiness is convective. You can see it ex sprouting along the cold front uh, in a number of places, in a number of instances. And then it wraps back around the center of the circulation. So there's probably an interesting thermal structure that we'll investigate with some of the model data. A fairly inactive ITCZ, in, at least in this part of the longitude band. Um, again, I'm really intrigued by this. How do you get such giant gaps in the teeth, if you will, of the ITCZ? at a transition season, it's, it's interesting to me. Um, there's been a recent paper that takes average 500 millibar vertical motion and kind of uses that as to, to show where the ITCC is active. And I gotta read that again, I found it interesting. Here's um, the upper level feature off the California coast, which we'll investigate a little bit more with some model data. And on the eastern side, pretty interesting, almost banded structures in the precipitation. This one in particular that starts offshore and makes its way onto the north coast is quite interesting. This one here may be well just be orographic. That's the spine of the, of the uh, of Cascade Range. But I'm not sure about this off the coast. And then uh, very cold air aloft. You can see this open cellular convection here, even in the satellite images, quite obviously uh, well spaced. So I'm going to guess, let's see if I'm right, I'm going to guess something in the minus 30 to 35 range at 500 millibars right off the coast of California. So let's see if that's right. When we call it. OK, so that's a feature of some interest. Um, I don't know about how it features into the forecast, but Patrick may be able to tell us something about that. 
Let's take a look at the... Before, uh, before we leave, oh, yes. I noticed this morning there was a severe thunderstorm watch for one of the islands of Hawaii this morning. I don't oh, know really? if I've ever seen that before. Yeah, so we're... I think you know, it was the far northwest one, this one over here. Oh, yeah, okay. And the people were commenting that, you know, they've seen flood oh, yeah. warnings all the time out there, but they couldn't remember a severe thunderstorm. That would watch. definitely make sense. Look at that burgeoning clouds shield, at least, over there. Yeah. Do we have a high Hawaii radar? Uh, Let's see if we can find it. I don't know if I'm plotting it. You might maybe at Honolulu uh, Weather Service they have it on. Uh, the yeah. Awesome. Okay, we do have one. So here's the state. And not quite the most northern island. I'd say there's these a, ones here. That's a warning, ones. though. Yeah. Some kind of warning. That doesn't look very good. That's a pretty thunderstorm sort of warning. Thing. I, I like guess it's a special marine warning, right? Yeah. That is, uh, uh -huh. so this is not when Gilligan's Island uh, ship should go out <laughs> on a three hour tour. It's, it's going to be longer than three hours, and yeah, at least it'll really feel like longer than three hours. Tie themselves out of the cooking. You don't want to be there, especially with Gilligan. Cool. Okay, let's, uh, that's great. Very interesting. And makes sense based on the radar, to, uh, the satellite. So let's go to the 500 millibot shots and the super peats, the, uh, let's stop there. So here's 500 millibars from the 7 o'clock this morning. Remember our cyclone over the east coast is sort of over the eastern part of New York State. It's nicely downstream of the upper trough. And there's even a little bit of a short wave embedded within this broader long wave trough there. I'm struck by the lack of barracoonicity in this whole eastern part of the upper trough. That's not always the case. And then I'll even say when you go to the west, you're talking about 5 degrees in this narrow strip. This is a really weak um, baroclinically weak upper trough. So it's not really that impressive a disturbance. Um, and yet, I think it's at the end of its life cycle is probably why. We'll see that in the forecast. But I think that, um, and yet it presents itself nicely on the satellite picture. And it took a while to gain that nice presentation, but that's the way it looks. Uh, so the, the lack of baroclinicity at 500 is a clue to make me want to see it at 8.50 in a minute. Here's the ridge axis to our west, and it's fairly sharply curved. And then there's even confluence, which is going to add another element of, of force and subsidence across this paraclinic zone. So we're going to be subsiding on the cold side there and downstream of the, uh, the ridge. So this whole oval is going to be a region of pretty decent subsidence. And that includes us. And so it's not surprising that we had a pretty nice day on tap. I am surprised by the uh, amount of fair weather cumulus clouds, except it is minus 25 at, the, uh, at 500 millibars over Green Bay, and presumably maybe even colder here because it's minus 28 at Des Moines. And the, the pocket of coldest air is right to our south and maybe over us. And so the stability is fairly low. I think our surface temperature is bound to be 60 something, so plus 15, and then minus 28, 43 degrees over about five kilometers. That's well past uh, conditionally unstable. So if the air is moist, then it's going to have a pretty easy time freely convecting at least to a level. And maybe that's what's giving us our high clouds. The large scale synoptic forcing should be discouraging that, and probably is. It might be worse if it weren't for the gentle substance in the background. But it's not particularly a cloud-free day, an otherwise nice day. Uh, and then the feature off California, look at that, minus 35. Yep. So just about. So this is the minus 30 contour. So that was about right in that estimate. And just in case you haven't heard me say why, when I was in Seattle for all those years as a graduate student, I was really intrigued by the size of the space between convective elements on these days where you're underneath a cold pool a lot. Because the boundary temperature is the same, and you've probably got sufficient water vapor to keep it saturated near the ground or close to it. So it struck me that if you have really poor stratification, then you're going to encourage stronger updrafts, which will mean bigger space around the updrafts for gentle subsidence. Because the subsidence doesn't get fueled by the instability quite the same way. Um, because you're, the air is subsiding and warming up, and you're in those clear spots, you're enhancing the stability by that. So it strikes me that the colder it is, the more intense the updraft, the bigger the spacing. And I bet, especially now with machine learning, you could probably find an exact relationship between the spacing of cloud elements and the 500 millibar temperature over a relatively uniform surface in the Pacific Ocean and the Northeast Pacific Basin is pretty uniform. And that turns out to be true. So yeah, machine learning, uh, watch the weather maps for eight years. There's some learning there too. So <laughs> you can do that. But I'd like to have it quantified. I can't do that. But look at how sharp the baroclinicity is on the back side. That's what's interesting. We'll look at this in a vertical cross section. The core is minus 35. This isotherm right here is, I want to make sure I get it right, that's minus 15. 
So we're talking about 20 degrees over this short distance at 500 millibars. That's a staggeringly strong upper level front. And whether or not that feature has an impact on weather over us, I don't know. I haven't looked forward. Uh, but this is bound to have also a really, a really intense upper vortex structure. If it gets itself organized and a little bit more isotropic, it can be a major weather producer um, downstream over maybe southwestern Canada and the central northern plains of our own country. So we'll see about that. Uh, or it could just continue to dig southward and become the next in line in a line of upper troughs that have kind of tapped that elevated mix layer over the northern states of Mexico. I've heard hints of severe weather around here on Tuesday, so maybe that's related. <coughs> okay, we'll have to see that. Then. Have to go the next picture of that. So those are some of the ingredients. So what I'll do in the rest of my time is we'll take a cross section through this thing on, uh, is it tropical does that? But before, let's go to 850 and just see if the baraclinicity at lower levels associated with this thing in the East Coast is any, any more intense. I don't want to bias my answer, but it does look weak here, doesn't it? It doesn't look like there's any really obvious strong cold front. Maybe down over Florida, there's five degrees in this interval and then five more to south of Atlanta, so that's 10 degrees. But that's it, that's the strongest baraclinicity associated with the cold frontal trough of this fairly intense cyclone over the uh, you know, north, northern part of Lake Huron. So that's a pretty intense disturbance at 850, strong winds around it, um, and chilly air, we're minus two or plus two at Green Bay, zero at Minneapolis at a mile above sea level. But there's no really strong warm frontal structure, there's five degrees here in central Quebec, uh, but that's it, and it's rather disconnected from much of the circulation. So this thing's kind of on its last legs, and that's to me, that's a clue. When, when, when it lacks baraclinicity, it's a winter storm. Uh, it's, a, it's a spring storm disguising itself as a winter storm. And when you look under the coat, you realize, oh, there's no baraclinicity. There's nothing that's going to really energize this thing anymore. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking on that. And then the ridginess is even more pronounced in the lower troposphere than it is at 500 millibars in roughly the same location. And we don't see really much manifestation at all of the really potent 500 millibar disturbance 1360 for a minimum of geopotential height is not really that low for 850. And there's a pool of cold air to the northwest, no really organized frontal-like structure to that. So that's clearly just an upper level front. And um, it has some uh, ability to force ascent off the Oregon coast, but not really well organized quite yet. So the, the last thing, Pete, let's take a look at the, um, I think, as I said, I think it's tropical that allow yep. us to do this but I can never seem to remember if it's pivotal or tropical that draws cross sections. So yeah, it's this one. Okay. So let's go to a different region. And that region will be, I think it was North, North Pacific. And so first to give you a, a picture of the situation right about now, 18Z. So here's the thickness in the colors. Blue are colder than, than the red warmer ones. Very intense thickness gradient right through there, and that's on the back side of that upper trough. Here's the teardrop shape of the geopotential height that we saw, and that's, of course, going to be reflected somewhat in the thickness field, which it is. And then precipitation generally where it's coldest, but not particularly allied to a region of low pressure. There's a little bit of one in inland here at, on the California Nevada border. A more intense storm, the one that Pete brought to our attention to for Hawaii's severe threat, even though it's removed from it, is further back here, and that's a fairly intense cyclone. It doesn't have really obvious extra tropical baraclinic characteristics either. It's got a little bit of a hint of a weak cold front, absolutely no hint, in my opinion, of a warm front, and just a really intense vortex at the center, 992 or so, which is pretty low for that latitude, 30 degrees north. Um, so if we can, Pete, let's draw our cross section just like this. That'll be too long. We don't have to go that long, so let's start from about here. Maybe. Thanks. Yeah, and then up to, yeah, that's good, right into Washington State. Okay, so that's cutting right through the main part of that. Let's go to the PV now and see what we get. Okay, so here's where we're cutting through, the maximum baraclinicity in the thickness field, and I draw that line perpendicular to those iso, uh, iso lines, and look at this. There is no subtropical tropopause. There's just the tropical tropopause at 200 millibars and the polar tropopause at 800. And this is 120 or 110 knots. It's a perfectly vertical jet core. Um, and you see that the stability in the warm air is exceptionally weak. These are five degree Kelvin intervals, and they span more than 100 millibars each. So the theta dp is really low there. And it's extremely sharp inside 
uh, the cyclonic shear side of the jet. Here's the upper front, the green lines are isotropes, and it cruises along at about 850 or so, 800 millibars. The baroclinicity resides higher, it does not reach the ground, and it's tied to this extraordinary jet. It seems like it's a co-located jet, Libby. Exactly the kind of thing you're talking about in the vague transition month. We can't make it, it's not obvious that this is a combination or a superposition of the polar and subtropical jets, but it is a weird feature. 110, it's 110 not it's meters per second, sorry. 110 meters per second. Those are, those are nuts. Rats. Oh. <laughs> They're nuts. All right. I'll still take it. It's still pretty good. <laughs> yeah, well, it's happened before. Though. We've seen 110 meters per second jets in the wintertime, though. They don't happen in the spring. But Libby's interesting result recently is that the springtime, or the, the summertime, we have to probably relegate it to June, July, and August and really see how that fits. But the warm season, May to November, May to October, let's say, that jet is unimodal and more intense than either of the two jets in the wintertime in the Northern Hemisphere. That's weird, and we don't understand that right now. We have to try and figure that out. One of the guesses is that most of the time when you get a jet core in the warm season, it's going to have characteristics of the superposition, which means it's going to have stronger winds. And I don't know why that would be generally the case, and that's going to be fun to try and figure that out. But you can see the extrusion of stratospheric PV goes all the way down to you know, 770 millibars in this really case. High PV that Sorry? Really high PV. Like exceptionally high. Yeah. yeah. So if you have all the ozone, that's probably there too. Absolutely. You could imagine that the ozone meters, if they're this high, if this thing came over the stations in Wyoming and Colorado, there'd be red lights beeping all over the states about ozone. Yeah, yeah. almost surely. And then the dry air that's associated with it comes down even lower in most instances. So you'd have a really extreme drying going on at some of these places below the ozone maximum. But that's weird. It's a really intense disturbance. Luckily, most of it now offshore. We'll see what its fate might be in the forecast discussion. So that's all I have. Sorry I took so much time. Patrick, thank you for looking at the forecast. Yeah, thank you. Pete, thank you for driving. Can we start with weather yeah, short, as always, Pete? And then I'll go back to this. Um, so exactly correct. This system that we were investigating is going to be uh, forcing for severe weather, including over our region. So if we could scroll down, and we'll go down, keep going, down to the severe tab here. Severe weather. So there's been severe weather noted for a couple of days now. First, if we click on this one from Monday, there's been a bullseye over Oklahoma over here. If we could, I don't know if you can stop this actually. Oh, we can click on that, yeah. Perfect. So there's been a bullseye over Oklahoma for a couple of days now um, because of that system off of the west coast of California. And then if we go to day five, more interesting for our region is we are currently under the gun for potential severe weather from this system and from how warm it's going to be in the next coming days. So I'll take a look at uh, very briefly from a synoptic viewpoint of why we might be expecting that severe weather. You can kind of make out there is going to be uh, some low pressure system sitting over you know, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and you can make out the cold front um, exceptionally well from just the outlook portion of this. So that might be a hint as to what is going to happen is we're going to be in a, there might be a substantial cold front associated with the cyclone, just from the shape of that um, banana looking yellow severe weather type outlook. So let's investigate this. So if we could go to our forecast maps, please. We can do the pie hunt. Yeah, that one. Perfect. And then let's start with 500. And let's try 12 hours first. I'll skip past wow. largely the forecast for the weekend because it's going to be beautiful. Dude. So that's the forecast is get outside for Saturday and Sunday. Um, it's going to be in the 70s. Beautiful, sunny. We have this ridge to thank. Um, you can see it's a very wide spanning ridge. Almost two thirds of the United States were in the backside of this trough that just moved over and brought some rain, it was raining last night, but the airport didn't report anything. Really? So, yeah. That's surprising. Yeah, there's a rain in miles too. Yeah, so I don't know what happened there, but we definitely got some rain, not a lot. Um, but you can make out from this picture first, even though this system is dying, I haven't looked at this time specifically, there is a substantial vorticity streamer um, on the bottom side of it. So we might expect some redevelopment of this. We can take a look at that, maybe into why, but the main feature here very tight vortex strip, very stubby, small feature compared to this system. So this is a developing system, this is a decaying system, but 
here is what we expect for our severe weather, the um, trough sitting over the west coast of the United States, and with it, substantial curvature and even sheer vorticity. Um, and that white in the shade is yeah. off the scale. Yeah. That's right. So it's greater than five times the Coriolis parameter? That's right. Wow. That's wildly non-geostrophic. That's non quasi geostrophic right. And if we could go to the same time, 12Z, yeah. uh, at the surface, sorry. Oh, take a look at, so right at my pointer, you can see there's very strong thermal wind. The thickness lines here, the yellow lines, indicate the direction of the thermal wind with cold air to its left in the northern hemisphere. So it's coming around the base of that trough. Right where we had that vort max and vorticity gradient is where we have really strong thermal wind. So you can expect really strong synoptic scale lift just directly to the south and east of where that um, minimum in sea level pressure is uh, at this time, but you can expect vigorous rising motion right out ahead of it. Um, at the same time, we see our system beginning to exit. We are currently, at this time, um, under the influence of high pressure, and you can see pretty substantial warm air advection, especially over the plains, with completely southerly flow from Texas all the way up to the Arpo Ar Lego, archipelago, there we go, um, of Canada. So this is uninterrupted flow. There's not much in between you know, the plains of Texas and the plains of Canada. Um, this is setting the stage for our severe weather here. Um, so if we could jump ahead 24 hours, please. To 36. Uh, yeah, 36 hours over 500. We can see the system barreling on to the coast of the, um, California and into Nevada. This system is becoming uh, kind of complicated with um, a vortex streamer spanning all the way around it. So I'm not going to focus on that anymore. We are currently in westerly flow. So this is a hint that we might warm substantially, especially in the um, central plains, because you have the Rockies sitting right here over the western part of the United States. Flow is going to move over the Rockies and sink on the lee side. As it sinks, it adiabatically compresses, and we warm. And so we should see that at this time, if we go to 850 now. Just one second. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, couplet of, um, of linear positive and negative vorticity in the Canadian Maritimes up to the mouth of the Labrador Sea. That's a squall line problem. Oh, that's <laughs> at that latitude, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's probably what that is. So that'll be something to watch. As we're will, sitting yeah. outside, you know, enjoying the sun and the weather, um, <laughs> weak winds, I would expect. So we go to 850 at this time, 36 hours. We should see a reflection. Yeah, right. exactly right. Here's all that warming that's going to conspire to um, make us have a beautiful day. And you can see strong warm air advection at 850 with these temperatures, which are close to 30 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's advected straight towards our region here. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see 90 degrees, some portions of maybe Colorado, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Texas. Um, and it's April. So that's a little weird. Um, you can see the different, stark difference then with cold air being infected on the backside of that system um, as it's barreling into California here. I don't well. know if 80's out of the question. No, yeah, we could definitely Tomorrow see close to 80. Tomorrow. Um, this is 6 p.m. Oh, I'll Sunday. show you, I'll show you. Maybe, Maybe Sunday. Sunday. Sunday, yeah. Sunday, yeah. Sunday morning. Yeah, 70's yeah. Yeah. sunny, it'll probably feel like 80 in the sun. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, so if we could go back, let's go to the surface just for completeness at the same time. And yeah, yeah, there yeah there's maybe a <laughs> squall line here. You can see the strong warmer advection over our region. Um, flow out of the southwest, maybe a lee side development, but our main system is still well off the coast here. Then we'll jump 24 hours from this time. At yeah, that lee side feature is uh, like a stand-in for what comes next, perhaps. Right, right. That's interesting. There we go. So now we're into Sunday afternoon. We're still in westerly flow. This system is beginning to move on um, over the Rockies. You can see a decent vortex strip on its south side, um, which we'll watch the evolution of that here in a second. But largely uh, just warming for Sunday over our region as well. Um, and can we look at 8.50 now at the same time, please? 60 hours. So here's another hint of that lee side warming. Um, maybe even some 80s, 90s, all the way into Montana, mm. which that's not uncommon. Um, it's weird to think about, but it's not uncommon from eastern Montana. Uh, we are maybe in some cold air advection right. at this time, which is interesting. 
seeing as Sunday is supposed to be the warmest day um, of the outlook. But nevertheless, we still have an area of uh, heat out ahead of um, that system. And you can see it is originating somewhat from the Gulf of Mexico. So there is moisture advection going on as well, even though I'm not showing that um, in these plots here. And if we could go to the surface now at 60 hours. Here we have the system beginning to develop. This is the main system of focus in the Colorado Rockies, um, and just to the east of those. We're in this no man's land of its weak synoptic flow, or sorry, weak uh, flow at the surface, um, indicated by the spacing of the isobars here. Uh, but our thicknesses have warmed, and so we'll continue to see warming here. Um, so we'll jump 24 hours now from this time. Yeah, that's why I'm thinking, I don't know if Sunday's gonna be warmer than Saturday. I was worried about that little bit of ch chilly infection, we'll call it. Yeah. But, yeah. I don't know. There'll be something to watch for sure. It's always been Sunday for yeah, like, right. a couple That's right. of times now. Here's where the action becomes. So here's now we're looking into the severe threat for Oklahoma. And you can see, first of all, you have a really nice trough um, sitting over you know, south of the Four Corners, which is perfect for severe weather in the plains. Because, as I showed before, you have moisture infection. Um, and warm air advection at 850, you have upper level divergence going on out ahead of this trough, and then you have a vortex strip on the south side. And so there's a decent amount of uh, vorticity gradient out ahead of this system, all conspiring uh, right over you know, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and northern Texas. Um, and so if we look at 850 now, I bet we'll see sort of the same inkling. Yeah, so. Here we have that warm, moist flow. It's coming straight off the Gulf. Uh, very warm, I should point out. Um, with the system now sitting over western Nebraska, you have a shift in uh, winds even at this height. Um, so your flow is going from at 850, it's off the Gulf uh, towards the northwest. At 500, it's coming off the southwest. Yeah. And then if we go to um, 300 at this time, I bet we'll see uh, even yeah, so now we're seeing even more of a wind shift. So you have veering, or, yeah, veering winds with height, um, which is indicate of warm air vection, and you have substantial shear going up in the atmosphere. And so that's all conspiring to set the stage for severe weather over the central plains uh, for Monday. And then if we could go back, we'll go to the surface just at that time, uh, 84. You can see here's some indication of that. Um, severe weather. We are still in warm air advection, as indicated by the southerly flow over our region, and crossing the thickness lines. Maybe even some precipitation as early as Monday, if whatever this is holds on and makes it to our region. But the main event is um, in the southern plains at this time. And we do the same thing if we could go 24 hours. This might be poorly future. timed in terms of the diurnal cycle too. If, you know, True. 6 p.m. ish is maybe not the right time to reap the reward of all of the cooking of the boundary layer that you've done, but that's true. Yeah, so this is not comprehensive. Um, I wonder if 18Z on, actually on 18Z on Tuesday would be a more interesting threat. For our region? No, for, for down in the Southern Plains. Yeah, I don't know if that's how that. conspired on the, on the one. Is that, um, yeah, let's do one. This might be a surface. I think a little, go a little back, maybe 78. Let's That's Monday. I'm thinking about Tuesday. Uh, so 24 hours ahead, 102. Oh, I guess not. Maybe it's just going to be um, saved by the by the diurnal cycle. Yeah, a little bit. It might be. Okay. But at this time, now we begin to get in some of the action. We can see a substantially deep cyclone 988 sitting over Nebraska at the surface. We are here's the inkling of some warm frontal boundary. So we might be in the warm frontal precipitation at 18Z uh, Tuesday, and then you can make out a cold run beginning to form. It's not substantial in the thickness yet, but there is precipitation along that um, cold front. So maybe we can get interesting here where we have a passing warm front and a cold front moving through our region. Um, both are mechanisms for lift, both are mechanisms for the wind shifting with height. Um, so we might be in some, for some interesting weather on Tuesday here. Um, if this whole thing develops as it's currently forecast, if we could go to 500 at this time. 102? Yeah, 102, I think that was it. Um, we can see our trough has become essentially north-south 
sitting just over the central plains and out ahead of it we are the beneficiaries of the um, upper level divergence, substantial vorticity gradient, and we saw the thermal wind um, would be affecting that uh, vorticity gradient over Iowa, Missouri, areas just to our west, uh, providing some lift uh, in that region. And then if we go to 850 at 102, we can see we're in a region of warmer advection. Um, at 850 as well. So things are looking likely for precipitation, at least for our region. Maybe even some thunderstorms. I know we haven't had a lot of those um, as of late. But Tuesday looks like an uh, interesting day for our region. Monday, interesting region or interesting day for the Southern Plains. And then the weekend is going to be beautiful and gorgeous and cloud free and sunny and nice and beautiful. So um, be sure to get outside this weekend for sure before we get all this rain on Tuesday as well. Any questions or comments? Can we look at the lifted index panel at this time? Oh yeah, I want to show that. Let's see how that looks. Oh, look at that. Ooh, yeah. Um, actually, can we go just a, one or two time steps forward? I know there was a, we were sort of in a bull, yeah, maybe 108. Uh, yeah, this might be good. So Wisconsin is right here. Anywhere we have this uh, dotted shading is where the a parcel that's lifted to 500 hectopascal is going to be warmer than the environment, um, meaning that it will continue to rise past that level. So anywhere in this dotted uh, contours, that's where you might expect um, added lift to the synoptic scale lift that's already occurring. And then the blue um, shading indicates that relative humidity is you know, decent from 850 to 500. So moist and added lift to whatever is already going on um, with the synoptic scale. Lift just to areas, it looks like Dubuque, Iowa, um, might be in that you know gun for maybe some substantial severe weather based on just the lifted index, and that might continue to make its way into our region as this whole thing develops as well. So definitely along the cold front as well, you can see moist and um, very convectively forced based on the lifted index here. Yeah, and one of the things that I, thanks for showing it, one of the reasons I like to look at it is because I imagine what the flow is doing. This, this testifies to a certain stratification in columns of air. And if the, if the columns of air are vected poleward across a baroclinic zone, then maybe the 850 to 500 millibar layer is no longer where the stratification is weak. It might be, you know, 700 to 300. True. But do we can? No. No. Because if, right. the, if the convection stops at 500 instead of 700 millibars, it still could be intense. Exactly. Because it'll draw on the same instability and the same water vapor trail. So, it, you know, this can give you, maybe it gives you in some ways, in a place where you have warm invection, an mm -hmm. understatement of where the stratification is liable to give you free convection. I think it might be more. Uh, liable to do so than is indicated yet. Absolutely. In our Completely agree, yeah. yeah. Especially since we're, you know, the experts are highlighting that we are in that sphere. Yeah, I think, so. that we, I think that's a good call for them. Yeah. All right, we can end it there. Thank you, Patrick. Thank, Thank you, you Pete. Pete.